my company IA Connects is the kind of, with a sort of glue in the middle, I like to think of ourselves. Everyone's had a good chat today about the built environment, both new, retrofit, sensor technology, monitoring, making informed decisions, and all of these things. But there comes a point in this when you kind of have to connect something to something, right? Um, and that's the bit that we like to involve ourselves in. So, there's a lot of stuff you're going to recognise on here, and I think I'm going to kind of just, what I'm going to explain is what we're about, and then hopefully a lot of this will make more sense to you. Because if you want to connect a sensor, whether it be a new build sensor, or a legacy, or a retrofit, from something to something to make an informed decision, there is some steps you have to go through, and it is a dangerous place to be, because there's an awful lot technology out there, there's an awful lot of communication protocols and there's certain things that, that, that will work but <coughs> won't work with something else. So we try to steer the collective to make sure that when they're looking for the data that they need to show off, we give them the right stuff in the right format. So over on the left, I'm a pointer by the way, so I'm going to move about a bit. Over on the left, there's some, a lot of wireless tech you're familiar with. Everyone's seen these, everyone in this room I'm sure has heard of Bluetooth, Zigbee, Zedway. IQRF, the ones you will have heard of, Wi-Fi, everyone knows Wi-Fi, workplace IPT. Like Everyone's familiar with different cloud providers that are out in this space at this moment in time. Amazon Web Services, the big boys I've listed at the top, IBM, Google. So what happens when you're trying to solve a problem, you've got an application, you want to choose some sensors. For most of the time, you're stuck in a space where you are compromised in your sensor choice because you've only really think about deploying one particular protocol or one particular technology. And that restricts your movement in that space. Yeah? So what you're looking for, in my mind, is a solution that gives you the ability to solve your problem, not based on the restriction of sensor type and communication technology, but what's most appropriate. And for a lot of applications, especially in my world, which is the IDOT world, you can never solve anything with just one sensor. It's all accumulation of data from multiple sensor points. So the key word in my business is agnostic. And I think that's what makes us different and that's what made us attractive to the collective when these guys were putting it together. Is we have a very neutral, we have a very agnostic approach to what we do. And that agnostic approach comes from both the sensors we select in the field and the destination. Okay? So when we talk about moving data from IoT sensors to a space, we don't care where it goes. I don't have a cloud. A lot of my peers have a lot of sensors and the way that you, as potential purchasers of that data would have to go through their cloud because that's the way that they earn their money. But the restriction is you're getting your data from their cloud. If you want multiple set technologies to solve your problem, you can finish up in the built environment with multiple gateway devices. Yeah? We've taken all that away. So what we specialize in is this ability to aggregate data from down here into a, into a single format. And there's a, there's a few interesting stats. When, because we come from the built environment, I'm always a bit nervous in academic spaces as well, by the way, because I never quite feel that my level of geography quite cuts the most. <laughs> but I do come from the built environment, so I'm, I'm that electrician guy that, that, that's been through this digital revolution to get me to where we are today. But we did some research on this, and we found 280 different languages in the built environment that exist in the silos that my colleague Paul described earlier on. Because traditionally, the built environment never really thought it had to talk to the digital world, it was just the built environment. And the way to retain your business was to make your own language. Tie somebody into that language and then they can't go anywhere else, which gives you that recurring revenue. The problem is now everybody wants to talk to each other. We've got this open architecture scenario. We now have to break into those different languages and try and bring them into a normal place. Now IT's involved. They don't talk to any of the built environment languages. They talk IT stuff. And the two things have never really come together. So our job is to merge those together. So when we look at these different, these different technologies, LoRaWAN, MOTION, Bluetooth, Sigfox, then we come into the industrial IoT space and we're talking about IPC, UA, OPC, UA, Kepler, BACnet, all of these different devices. They have to be rationalised into a single protocol that the ana analysis tools at the top understand. And for us, that's a, a, a protocol called MQTT, which if you get into that space in the future, it'll be the, the, the most prevalent. prevalent. So that's what we do. So we have these devices that do this for you. Okay? Don't worry too much about the next three slides. The point I'm trying to make is that actually there's a lot of commonality in sensors. When you're looking at monitoring <laughs> temperature, humidity, CO2, volatile compounds, lux levels, vibration analysis, that's an office environment. That's a home and domestic environment. Yeah, That's a hospital environment. The sensors are all the same. 
the technology is the same. Don't be afraid of it. So you can use the same sensor. It's not, it's not tied to vertical silos and horizontal spaces. All of these sensors are the same. Wireless technology these days, if, if, if we all have it in our homes, we have it in our pockets, we have it in our phones, it really does work. The biggest problem we have is convincing the construction companies and the consultants that it works. And I'll go back to the first keynote this morning about about not, <laughs> not accepting change. Why do we continue to do these things the same way? To the point where our, our experiences with UK construction companies now and the, some of the biggest M&E companies in the world, the first time we got them to try and use wireless for switching lighting, they still put conduits and cables in the walls behind the wireless switch just in case the wireless switch didn't work. <laughs> it's one of the biggest companies in the UK and Europe that still does this because their lead electrician didn't believe me when we said that honest the wireless thing does work these days boys it can be fine okay so there's a lot of commonality there so so how do we do this we, we are not going to dwell too much on my own products but we have a gateway device and that for us is, is, is the key to everything that we do yeah that's the thing that takes all of these wireless protocols all this IOT data and it sends it across to these boys over here who do the clever stuff and they do the shiny bit on the top yeah so this is the product that we use and we connect using these multiple connection points and we bring it all into a single vehicle and we can pull the data out the top. Now, a little bit of an insight into what makes it different. Systems integration historically has been one of those kind of minefields where a lot of people made a lot of money because actually the tools that they used to create an action and to, and to create a result were, were done in codes and languages that nobody ever understood. So vendors would have to pay significant amounts of money to make changes or well, first to create these things they would have to pay commission engineers and I'm not going to lie we've got some of those commission engineers and we've done quite well out there in the past but, but honestly should we in this day and age be paying hundreds of pounds per day for a guy to turn up the laptop to make some changes to a system that you own that cost you a fortune in the first place I just don't think it's acceptable so what we've done is we've thrown that our own business almost in the bin we've turned our back on that traditional environment and we've moved to a space now where we create our own software platform in the IoT space that utilizes real words that people understand so that the actual system owners and the stakeholders now can start to look at the processes that are going on inside their control space and it's represented by real words that people understand. In this instance, we use that before this, we use a product from uh, IBM. Uh, they have a tool set called Node Red, which it's very much a drag and drop tool and we can do very, very complex control systems now utilising just this. And the reason we do this is because when it gets handed over to the client for the OPEX phase, their maintenance teams can make these changes themselves because everything is represented in real words. They don't have to pay me hundreds of pounds to send my guy down with a laptop to make those changes because they don't understand it. And fundamentally we think that's, that's really, really important. A slide here was showing that this is, this is a my learned colleague Paul, who mentioned the asset management system. The reason we're doing this is because this is, a, this is an instance of IBM's Maximo, and we are taking IoT data from the field now and feeding it live into smarter asset management systems. It's no longer a dummy asset. So everything the guys have referred to now is coming through uh, my system, and it's providing that live data, and we're firing it up to those guys for, uh, for analysis. Okay. So, conscious that we're about five minutes from dinner, we're going to... I just want to run you through, my, my job when they asked me to come along was to just run you through some use cases. And these are real, I've not made these up, these are actual things that we've been doing. Um, that's working at this moment in time, some spaces you may be familiar with, just to give you a feel for what we do. Um, uh, the government has a series of catapults, there's a high value manufacturing catapult, there's a digital catapult. Uh, there's multiple of these, of these government and private industry funded areas. The digital catapult in London. Um, very much involved in the rollout of 5G, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we've got some technology running there now where they're looking at the hot desks that they have. This reception now can tell the people where they want to sit because we've got under desk sensors, all wireless, all energy harvesting, all batteryless, just fastened under the desks, off they go. But at the same time as they're doing that, we're also measuring the levels of temperature in those spaces, in the meeting rooms, humidity, CO2 levels. But we're purging the system. We're not just giving you that information because it's pretty to look at. Our system enables you to be able to tell the building management system that the CO2 levels are too high. And the, and the, and, and the building management system needs to do something about this, like recirculating the air and actually making changes, which is really what you have to believe in. There's no point in gathering the data just for looking at it. You've got to make a change. 
So whatever system you choose, whether it's me or another, make sure it has that backwards connectivity to tell the system you've made a decision, now make a change. So that's digital platform. Again, indoor calls to measure it. This is huge now, especially in educational environments now, to the point where we're not a manufacturer per se, but we've actually started making our own um, air quality monitors. Because, again, it was something that in the industry was very expensive. And, and to be honest, you want these things everywhere. So we've moved into doing this ourselves now. And you can buy these as, as a standalone entity or multiples of them, and you can then start to look at the data and training data that you've got further along. Um, Somebody this morning, this is somewhat fortuitous, I didn't plan this, mentioned keeping people in the homes, the healthcare market, which is hugely relevant at this moment in time. Um, we're working with a, uh, a company called Carantis 360. And these guys are, uh, they have a digital platform for uh, care workers who go into elderly people and social, social housing applications to keep people um, in their home by using IoT devices. Now what I mean by that is, um, correct me if I'm wrong, elderly people, and I'll include my own, my own parents in this, they're creatures of habit. They get up every morning at a certain time and then they follow a certain routine. It's up, toilet, kettle, toilet, kitchen again, living room, toilet, <laughs> and the list goes on. But these patterns are repetitive and that's what they do. So actually by putting simple sensors in the bathroom, in the kitchen, in the thing, on the seat, by simply following these patterns on a daily basis, the system knows that as long as they're following that pattern, they're pretty much okay. But what these guys are now doing is they're actually starting to engage with clinicians because they're going, well, this is actually really cool. These people, we, we can monitor them. We have a carer coming in, but we don't have to rush them. They can stay on their normal time. But they're now engaging with the clinicians as well because they're going, well, hang on a minute. That person got up five times last night. The system has sent a message out in the morning to say there was a toilet activation five times last night. Why was that? The system's learning because it operates on my algorithms and it says, well, actually, that's a problem. Why did they get up five times last night? But actually, equally, the system can say that's not a problem because we know from the data that's captured on the system that they've got a urine infection, so we're kind of expecting them to do that and they've just come out of hospital and all that's acceptable. Okay? The reason they like us is because the system that shows you going back three or four slides with the node red instance in there, it gives them the ability through their own software teams to make these changes in the system. So if that pensioner decides that they've just retired, they no longer want to get up at 7 o'clock in the morning, they're going to get up at 8 o'clock, they can change the system just like that. So the system now doesn't expect them to get out of bed till 8 o'clock. There's no massive engineering exercise that costs thousands of pounds to make, to make a change. They've moved it on. Because we've deployed the wireless technology at low cost in that property, we can now monitor for leaks. We can monitor CO2 levels. We can monitor temperature levels. Yeah? We're interfacing with energy companies. Even the big energy companies now are going, oh, that's really interesting. Actually, let's keep an eye on the energy because if my parents, if my parents happened to be in a position where they were struggling to finance their own energy in that, um, in that space, come the winter, if it's particularly cold in one room, it might be because they don't want to turn the heating on because they think the bill's going to go up. The energy companies are now coming to us and going, we can share that cost. We've now got the facility. Now you've given us the data and the connectivity. I can pay for that heating and that overage. Yeah, so there's lots of really cool things that are coming out of these interactions as we start to open up the ecosystem. Um, Gatwick Airport, classic. Gatwick Airport spent a fortune on toilets recently. I don't, has anyone flown out of airports recently? The toilet experience in Gatwick just gets better and better and better. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm a toilet experience connoisseur in airports, but I do spend a lot of time in airports. Right? Okay. Um, but yeah, they spent a fortune. I mean, literally hundreds of thousands of pounds which was great <coughs> until two weeks after they opened it, it flooded. <laughs> because, because the pipe work in the background, water hammer on the pipe, pipe burst, pipe always pipes as they do in that environment, they always burst on the wrong side of the isolator and they, they flooded it. Okay? So because, because Gatwick Airport actually, uh, although it took two years to convince them that wireless wasn't magic, right, and it does work, they realised that in the very next section of that particular building, they've deployed wireless switching for the light and control system, which we did see. Because the transmit and receive devices that were installed are within a 30 metre radius of this, all we had to install was these little bad boys. So these are 150 pounds, 100 pounds, something like that, as a lead detection device. Energy harvesting, no batteries. Sits there, minds its own business now at the back of these, where the pipe work and what have you is. In the event of a leak, it does nothing more than expand these little bushes, triggers a signal, 
there's an N ocean valve, an N ocean relay now sits next to the isolation valve, so the minute there's a leak, it turns the water off. Sends a tweet, sends an email, and sends a message to the guys to go, we've just had to turn the water off, guys, there's a leak, no damage. I think the cost of repairing it, I think I put the numbers on here, you know, the cost of repair for the recent flood was 35 grand, and the cost of installing the solution to protect it in the future was less than two and a half. So the numbers speak up for themselves, and when we get to the people at the top of Gatwick Airport that are in charge of the big pile of beans, they like that, because the ROI on that is very, very, very short. Yeah. Again, different, completely different case. This is a, this is a, a big um, distribution, parts distribution company. Um, we looked at their warehouse. Now, sadly, it's very difficult to represent the size of a warehouse on a PowerPoint. Um, it was a lot bigger than that, is all I can say to you. Typical warehouse, 100 meters by 150 meters, etc., etc. And again, by, by simply deploying, I think, three antennas across the whole building, um, for a sub £10,000 application, we monitored the offices and the spatial usage of the offices. We monitored the current down to circuit level to make sure that, because what tends to happen in offices, as we all know, is under everyone's desk, everybody's got a six-way adapter plugged into a single socket with six different things plugged into it plus another extender. And things start to get warm and they were actually getting overheating in trunkings and conduits. That's all being monitored now so we can see who's abusing the system. In the warehouse, we're monitoring the air handling units, so we're checking for current, we're checking for temperature, external temperature, on the air handling units, all again by wireless through the same series of antennas. Automated packing desks that they have uh, to facilitate disabled people in the workplace because everybody's doing boxes all day, they have assisted packing benches of which they have six. All of these devices used to get serviced all at the same time, on the same day, every year. You'd think that was all right. But the truth of the matter is, they didn't need that because it was only the first three that ever got used. But to try and keep it simple, nobody, you know, they've had people coming in to look at IoT applications. All we did was monitor the current usage on the main supply to each of the six devices. And we said, by monitoring the current, we know whether it's in use or it's not, and then we log the number of hours that it's in use. And now what they do is they rotate it. So instead of just using one, two, and three, when people come in, they split them up, so by the time it gets to the point where they need a service, A, they don't all have to be done on the same day, and B, you've got equal measure across all six of the devices. We monitored fridges. A lot of stuff that goes in fridges in this distribution centre is worth a lot of money. It's simple. We use temperature sensing, we use the LoRaWAN connection, and then we monitor fridges. So if the temperature drops or the power drops, if somebody gets a tweet, someone gets a text. Really, really simple stuff. And again, lighting control. You didn't need a full-fledged lighting control system. We just we just effectively intercepted some of the circuits for some of the lights, put in a lux sensor, and then we used the software to make sure that whatever the lux levels were at certain points, we were just using simple 35-pound relays to drop lights off to save energy as it went along. All works beautifully. Yeah. Um, the, these are really cool. This is just some meter reading exercise we've done. And again, this was a global FM provider from ISS. I'm not allowed to say their name. Um, they, they, again, they had a man in a van that used to go around and do this. Um, and I feel a bit guilty because he, I'm sure we found him something else to do. Um, anyway. <laughs> but these things are optical readers. These are really, really cool. These, these, these things really do work. It's just an optical reader that sits over the top of the meter. And on demand, it sends the information about what's going on on the meter. Uh, they put it into a gateway. The gateway had a 3G SIM card in it, so we were even off network. Uh, and we now want all of these things all the time. Yeah. Uh, Dublin Airport, to close this one down, I think this is the last one. Dublin Airport, uh, for those of you that have been in airports, the most important part of any airport, the bit that's hardest to get at, is anything to do with baggage. Um, so we monitor, we monitor and notice temperature, vibration. Yeah, everything's retrofitted, it's all wireless sensors that are pumped onto the motor. And again, we just monitor that. And this dashboarding thing is, 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 again, I say we don't do dashboarding, but as part of the system, this is something that's a bit no red off as it's an IBM tool. Um, so it gives them the ability to look at a phone, and the engineering manager looks at his phone, um, and within, 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 within a day of firing this system up, they realised that they had a phase imbalance because they were monitoring current, and they didn't have a phase imbalance across the three phases, which was one of the things that was causing the problems. That was a, that was a byproduct of, uh, of what they did. So, um, I, hope, I hope I'll give you a flavour for what we do and, and where I sit in this ecosystem of, of partners. Thank you.